Hi, everybody. Welcome to New Frontiers in Functional Medicine, where we are interviewing the best minds in functional medicine. And I am really excited to be back with Mark Newman. He's a longtime friend and colleague, one of the first people I podcasted with. He's brilliant. He always leaves me thinking and just feeling like I'm a, a more informed, better clinician. Let me give you his background and we will jump right in. Uh, Mark is the president and founder of the Dutch Test. Everybody knows Precision Analytical as Dutch, but that is the, the company is Precision Analytical and their famous test is Dutch. He's a recognized expert in, in and international speaker in the field of hormone testing. He spent nearly 25 years developing and directing 24-hour urine, organic acid, and salivary hormone testing labs. His unique experience led him to pursue a revolutionary way to test hormones. Mark began his own lab, Precision Analytical, to create the most comprehensive functional hormone test available, the DUTCH, which stands for Dried Urine Test for Comprehensive Hormones. Mark is committed to making it easier for patients and their healthcare providers to answer complex clinical questions through extensive education on validated hormone research. Every day, he and his team of experts work through their mission to profoundly change one life and then a million more through industry-leading functional hormone testing and education. Mark, once again, welcome to New Frontiers. Thrilled to be here. Good to chat with you. And I just want to let everybody know that, you know, I've got some, some of my most favorite blogs come from Dutch. I, I, I mostly call you Dutch. I think everybody calls you guys Dutch. Uh, and we're going to put those, we'll put the, the blogs that you've, that you've authored for us. My favorite testosterone blog. It's so, so useful for clinicians as well as for patients. It's so well referenced. There's a great blog in there on um, hormone replacement therapy as well. And then all of our podcasts over the years, you know, we'll just park everything on the show notes and go there and check them out, folks. Um, you'll certainly want to listen to some and, and just download some of the content. And also we will put a sample Dutch report over on the show notes as well. Uh, I often encourage people to just have that up uh, so that when Mark refers to what they're doing, you can take a look at it and, and, and have that um, but before we, we dive into talking about hormones, just tell me what's up over at, over at precision, what you guys are working on, what new analytes yeah, I know you've been, you know, you've been evolving the test for years. You have that yeah. foundation in hormones and then, you know, you've been going. Yeah. I was still, um, just trying to tell a better story. You know, um, I'd say that comes kind of in three sections for us. One is just the validation of what we've already done. Uh, which is just trying to get publications out there that show uh, the utility of the testing. And then also as as we've done that, we've learned where there's limited utility. And so that's, you know, our our mission is to is to put this in the hands of people uh, at the most opportune sort of times and scenarios um, and to make sure that the claims that we're basing what we do upon um, are provable and then proven. So there's a lot of yeah. effort going going into that in terms of statistics and writing and that sort of thing. Um, and then just making it more palatable for people, uh, you know, it, it is the C stands for comprehensive in Dutch. And, and sometimes that's so wonderful because you get so much information, but it can also be overwhelming. So we have a new interp guide that we put out that's, you know, yay thick and just really well sectioned out. So if you want to learn about premenopausal women and cortisol or postmenopausal women and uh, whatever, or men and, you know, um, testosterone metabolism, whatever it is, um, that you've got a really good reference there. And then we have a new course, a mastering hormone course, so people can kind of get basically hormones 101 and Dutch 101 and just kind of work through that so that they can just be more confident and competent at hormones generally and then applying the Dutch test and trying to get, just trying to really get the value out of that. And then mm -hmm. the third part of it, which is the most fun for me, um, is broadening the story. So we've been adding, you know, we started with hormone metabolites. We've added some of those over time. Um, but then we've also folded in, which has kind of been a unique thing that, that we've done is to take related, but non-hormonal tests that fold into the story. Um, you know, we added melatonin and eight hydroxy oxidative yeah. stress marker and, and some of those others. And then recently, fairly recently, we've added, um, a biotin marker, a neuroinflammation marker and indican for a gut marker. And that's been, um, that's been great to just sort of you know, add to the story that we're already telling. Nice, nice. I want to just, again, um, let folks know that we'll grab 
the publications that Mark's referring to and park them on the show notes. And if we can get that interp guide and have a link to that on the on the show notes as well, so people can access it. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember when you launched Cortisol Awakening Response, just such mm -hmm. an incredibly useful, essential evolution of salivary cortisol testing. And I'm really glad to have that, um, to just kind of thinking about it historically. I remember we have, you know, it's just, it's, we, we all use it in functional medicine. Yeah. You know, it's just such an important tool. And then after that, you brought in the organic acids to begin to look at the gut and to begin to uh -huh. look at nutrients and, you know, and to look and see where sort of serotonin is and, you know, just some important markers. And so I, I, I appreciate your evolution. If anybody isn't familiar with the cortisol awakening response, um, I want to talk about your the or, new organic acid markers, but just give me a little, you know, high level what it is. Sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, we started with just a straight urine test, which is a nice way to look at the diurnal pattern of cortisol. You can do that in saliva, you can do it in urine. Um, and that's been a mainstay of functional testing is is cortisol bouncing up high enough in the morning and then dropping off appropriately at bedtime? You know, if you're inverted, you got a problem. Um, and then the literature really compelled us to add to that story because while that's an interesting story, um, the cortisol awakening response, which is is simply the gap between right at waking and 30 minutes later, that that dynamic gap um, is is a great way. It's it's an independent marker of HPA axis function. People call it a mini stress test because, yeah. you know, what you'd want in your office is to have a bear in the closet, right? And you can test their cortisol, pull the bear out, let it chase mm -hmm. them around and then test them again. And you say, okay, when you're, when you're like legit stressed, um, what happens to your cortisol? And that biochemistry happens upon waking. Now a urine test doesn't work for that because when you urinate, when you wake up, that's a while you're sleeping measurement, but a salivary yeah. measurement right at waking, um, tell it gives you that baseline and then you add one 30 minutes later and if that's exaggerated then your your stress response is exaggerated and if that's flat then even if it's within the normal range but that dynamic bounce is not there then your resilience of your stress response is maybe not what it needs to be um and that's a really useful marker and so the only way we could do that with was saliva so even though we were an all urine test we added the salivary markers uh, we tried first like spit in the tube, like most people do. But the thing is that cortisol changes within five yeah. minutes. So if your yeah. tube is half full after five minutes, you're sunk. And so we use the cotton swab to get a really like immediate measurement at waking and then 30 minutes later. And then we, we mix that with all the other stuff that we measure cortisol metabolites and all the other things that are part of Dutch. Um, and so we call that Dutch plus. So it's the saliva and the, the dried urine in one really comprehensive test and it just again it just adds one more variable but it's a really important one and the, the literature makes that clear um that if that's abnormal it's worth addressing fabulous i know one of the biggest criticisms of salivary cortisol testing is the reliability and specimen collection and i think it's huge that you've figured out a way to do that where you can actually capture that very you know precise moment yeah. or those well, two precise moments. Yeah. It's almost comical where some of the people have just sort of accidentally like found themselves in terms of collection. Cause they'll give you a tube. They'll say, don't eat, don't drink, don't rinse your mouth. You just woke up, fill this thing like <laughs> that full of spit and be done in five minutes. And it's like, Oh my gosh. Like it's just, they're just the funny little practical things that can, that can um, catch us up. And then they can move to the cotton swabs, except the cotton swabs absorb progesterone. So if you're also doing your sex hormones out of saliva, which are notoriously difficult in saliva, which is why we use urine, um, then sometimes it's just the logistical things that needed that needed a solution to be able to put easily in people's hands, you know, a way to get more comprehensive with, uh, you know, that HPA axis, you know, assessment. Yeah, yeah. And, and also reliable, I think. Um, listen, we're going to jump into the organic acids in a second, but I just want to say that you know, the for anybody new to Dutch, the sort of the game changer for our patients is that they're not collecting a 24 hour urine. They're not walk, they're not going through their life for that specimen collection with a big jug 
either in their house or in their car collecting right. every every drop of urine throughout the day which you know i come from a lab background as and and that's what we would do you know in the right. lab when we were testing new urine analytes everybody other everybody in the lab would be collecting their pee and there'd be pee right. jokes. you know you remember right. those days i'm sure yeah, but you, you, you you revolutionized that but yeah T- just yeah. talk to him. Well, I mean, yeah, you you laugh at each other while you're doing it in the lab, but when you work at Nordstrom or whatever, yeah. it's like, it really is like it's not a cool. <laughs> to actually getting the testing done, you know. Yeah. So. so you have this, you just have this, the, this four, four specimen dried urine collections, easy, very portable. Yeah. To your point, if you're working at Nordstrom, you can just pop them in your you know, in they're your purse, easy. you can put it in your pocket. They're, they're, they're pretty small and they, you know, yeah. and they dry rapidly and that's your, and it's, a, it, and it's consistent with a 24 right. hour urine. Yeah. And the idea is, that. is for most of the time you can just collect yeah. it home, right? You get home, you collect you know, yeah. dinner time, bedtime at waking two hours later and go about your business and then send them in the next day. And yeah, we're trying to make it really simple for people because that's, that's a practical, I mean, I, I get some people who will, so I've had this for six months and I'm literally like trying to work it into my schedule. And so every little bit you can do to make it easier, you know, helps. Yeah. Yeah. So it's doable. It's doable. It's, it, it is. I, I, um, you know, I, I love it. It was a stroke of brilliance on your part, actually, to, to create oh, that, you. that testing. Um, all right. Analytes. Let's talk about Indikin. It's one of my favorites. I would, you know, as yeah. I was preparing for this podcast, I was, um, I was curious, you know, so Indikin is an old school marker. The name Very. Indikin is old school. The The chemical name is indoxyl sulfate. But, you know, I don't know if you know this, Mark, and I can send it to you. It was the, the it was first uh, characterized in like 1850. Yeah. And, you know, they just saw these these color changes in urine and right. they na- and, and, and they named it Indikin. Um we knew, I mean, old school naturopathic medicine. So in my background, you know, or nature cure, not necessarily NDs, but people in, in, into nature cure were looking at, were doing Indican tests in their office. And we knew then, like, I don't know, the fifties, the forties, maybe that it did have to do with dysbiosis. And it was something that you could just do in office. Um, but it's evolved. And, and, and we now know that, well, we knew that it was, it's made from tryptophan and that it's bacterial action on the tryptophan. And when there's a high accumulation, um, it's dysbiosis. You know, that was my training back in the day, but now we know it's associated with MS. It's a potentially associated with Parkinson's disease. It's associated with these neurodegenerative conditions. Like it's, it's, it's gotten a renewed um, spotlight uh, and there's some more sophisticated research going on. So, you know, I think it's a really smart addition. Yeah. Oh, no, I appreciate that. I think, um, I mean, that's just kind of the, the fun part of what we do is that peeling of the, the the onion of the layers of relevance of these things. Because for us, really, the, the focus wasn't um, quite so esoteric. It was just simply that, you know, if you have a gut issue, then we know you're <laughs> going to have problem getting rid of your estrogen, right? Yes, and we've, exactly. we've actually correlated that data now that people who have higher indican have higher estradiol. So both male and female patients, because if you've got gut issues, then you've got uh, beta glucuronidase issues. So as your estrogen turns into the estrogen conjugate and it's ready to go out, the conjugate gets broken off by that enzyme and whoop, it gets recirculated. And so um, for, for us, we know it's not the end all be all of gut health. It's really just an indication that it's worth pursuing, um, in, interrogation in that, in that area. Um, and we know gut health is so important to people. And, you know, if you're doing an extensive gut test, it's not that useful, but if you're just doing your Dutch test and that's flared up high, um, then it's definitely worth pursuing, um, just trying to figure out if, like the level of dysfunction that you have there. And the reason yeah. that we chose that marker is because just practically it's uh, it works in our mass spec assay where we're already looking for these other oats. So that's helpful. So we didn't have to, you know, in terms of pricing and things like that, it's, it was uh, a reasonable to do, but more importantly, there's literature support for it. And that to me, that is, and I haven't dug into the specifics for a while, but when I was doing a lot of organic acid testing way back when, that was part of my frustrations. I've had this whole list of gut markers. And then as I took each one and I'm like, okay, where, where are the papers for this one and this one and this one? It was, it was really disappointing that a lot of it was just a lot of conjecture. Yeah. Um, and a lot of them were related to, gee, if you eat this one, you know, if you yes. eat something with a lot of benzoate in it, then it creates a lot of <laughs> uric acid, whether yes. you have gut issues or not. And yeah. 
like, gee, that's that's a pretty cloudy picture. And so with Indican, it's pretty clear that when it's elevated, something's going on in the gut. It's not hyper specific yes. um, for conditions other than just that sort of umbrella term of, of dysbiosis, right. um, which has which has moved out of your voodoo naturopathic world into <laughs> into traditional, it's, you know, allopathic it's uptown. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's where, right. they, where they're actually going to, you know, buy into the concept that has been proven out over time. And so, yeah, so it's, it's a nice marker to add into the hormone story. Again, when you're yeah. dealing with estrogen dominance and things that are related to the gut, it's a nice piece of the puzzle. Absolutely. hundred percent. It'll flag one to say, you know, further investigation needed and, you know, let's be mindful if we're starting HRT in this or whatever, whatever we're, right. is going on that's prompting right. to doing the Dutch. It's just a little bit right. of insight. You're right. Yeah. It is nonspecific, but it's important. You know, it's bacterial right. and action it's, on and tryptophan and, and, and widespread imbalances can ensue. And that piece of activity, you know, indicates protein malabsorption. I mean, there's just all sorts right. of, of mischievousness happening when yeah, we see high and, indican. And it is, um, you know, it is a level of sophistication higher where you have a urine sample and you're just looking for color change. And now it's a quantitative MS, assay yeah. that's, you know, going to be relative to creatinine. So if you're, if you're yes. hydrated, dehydrated, it's still going to give you like a solid quantitative results. And so that's, that's going to allow us to take that analysis higher than where it would have been in your old school test. In 1800s, and then to yeah. Take, yeah. And then to take that data and start correlating it with, with other things, as you mentioned, it's, it's getting a, a lot more um, traction in terms of its relevance, but the, the value needs to be as accurate as possible. Um, and yeah. You so guys are using LC, mm -hmm. LC tandem mass spec on it. Yep. That, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's a tad better than the 1800s. Then you know, using your eyes visual. And, um, like, yeah. <laughs> um, so bravo, that's a smart addition. Um, and then you've got the biotin marker, the classic biotin right. marker. And again, I think it's, you know, it's a good, it's a good addition. So that one actually could, this is something that uh, could suggest bacteria as well, but you know, the, our ability to metabolize it out is uh, dependent on biotin, but let me just let you talk about it and, you know, just why you brought it in. Yeah. There's, I mean, again, it's, it's telling the full story is what we're after and it's a hormone story. So how does that tie into hormones? So to me, one of the best uses for Dutch is in the PCOS crowd. And you can say I have PCOS, but you can also more broadly say just women with high androgen like issues, right? Yeah. So what are their issues? One, they make too much DHEA and androstenedione, meaning adrenal androgens. That's one potential issue. Two is too much testosterone. Um, so that can come in PCOS from the ovaries. And so that's, that's independent somewhat of your adrenal androgens, and then they combine. And so you've got that, that is an issue. That's a production hormone production issue. But then in addition, as we know, if you've got the insulin issue going on, what does insulin upregulate? It upregulates 5-alpha reductase, now my testosterone turns into DHT, 5-alpha dihydrotestosterone. And we know that's about three times more potent and it can lead to acne, facial hair, and thinning scalp hair. So, okay, well, if you have someone with thinning scalp hair and you're interrogating that and the androgen contribution, what if they have an overt biotin deficiency on top of that? We know one of the consequences of biotin deficiency is hair loss. And so it ties into that story in that way. Obviously if you're biotin deficient, um, it's likely your life is less optimal. So it's not, it's, it doesn't have to be about hormones, but the reason that we pursued it is same as before is twofold. One, there's literature support. It's not just a hypothetical marker for biotin deficiency. There is literature that says when this goes up in, well, I guess I should reverse it. When you have a biotin deficiency, this is elevated, um, in urine. And then secondarily, as I just explained, it folds into the hormone story. Um, cause the, the thing we want to avoid is someone who's just beating their head against the wall, trying to figure out like, you know, have I moved away from DHT production enough to get my hair loss to get better? Well, if you have a thyroid issue or a biotin issue and you know, the thyroid evaluation has to come from your blood testing, but if you're not covering all of your bases, then, you know, some of those patients are going to get really frustrated. And so we want to help these doctors succeed. And that's just another I think tool that we can put in there. And the other thing is it's simple. If it's high, you're probably deficient. If it's not, you can ignore it, move on, right? Um, so it doesn't yeah. add really to the complexity of the story, but it it's another piece. 
I think it's great. I think it's it's awesome. You know, it's funny. I it, just reading your your new assays prompted me to bust out my Metametrics handbook of all Sorry, organic yeah. assets. I actually Dr. Lord. <laughs> I authored, I, I was one of the authors on this. I was at the lab at the time when we published right. this with Dr. Lord. Um, and all those compounds are in there. And I'm just thinking if people will want to access this. And it's, I don't think it's available anymore, but um, uh, the laboratory evaluations textbook might be available on Amazon. Anyway, if anybody's interested in kind of pursuing those, let me know and I'll um, yeah, uh, I mean, I have email it, me. You've got I that have it yeah. in my office somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a great book. But these are, you know, they're fun. They're older resources, but you know, these are older analytes and some of the I think it's, you know, if we can access them, it's a fun place. It's a fun place to start. But with both of these compounds, what's nice for me to see is that newer eyes are looking at them and we're seeing newer, newer research. So we're not just looking at papers from, you know, the 60s and 70s anymore. Um, we're, we're seeing, you know, just newer scientists get interested in these markers and their reliability. And then the other piece I wanted to say about biotin and or the, the hydro, beta hydroxyisovalerate, which is the marker that elevates um, right. in response to biotin deficiency, is that biotin is a gatekeeper for appropriate protein, fatty acid, and carbohydrate metabolism. So just to your point, you know, it's fundamental to basic to everything. Um, and a biotin deficiency therefore shows up all over the place. We tend to see it in the, in tissue turning over the quickest. I mean, you can see skin changes. You talked about yeah. hair loss, but, um, you know, seborrheic dermatitis for me is a shoe in to just give biotin a shot. Um, because sometimes you'll clear real bad seborrheic dermatitis with a round of biotin, but, um, we see it, you know, we, it's such a, it's such a fundamental player in, in such widespread, um, processes, metabolic processes in the body that, uh, you know, broad body of, 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 of symptomatology and powerful um, benefit with correcting it. We used to, when I was in the lab, we used to see biotin beta hydroxy isovalerate elevated in, in kids on this, on the autistic spectrum. And, you know, again, powerful responses. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so smart, good. And I don't think, and I just want to say, I know the last time we talked about organic acids, you added these without shifting the price of the Dutch. Like this was just yeah. because you guys could do it. Yeah, yeah, it was independent of that. I mean, we've um, bad news in that uh, when you're in business 10 years, you do have to raise prices eventually. And so we, we've had <laughs> one price one price increase in the history of our wow, company. Wow, that's uh, it? was last July or something like that. Wow. Um, and the, the, the organic acids came out before that. Yeah, our, our lab people did a really great job of, of retooling our LCMS method so that it could grab the things we were already testing. Uh, we we have five different assays. So there's an estrogen assay and an androgen assay and, and then an oats assay. And so they they were able to creatively fold those in um, without um, without it really changing the method that fundamentally, which was which was awesome. And that's what we're always, you know, trying to do is um, you know, tell the story in an efficient way uh, too, because we know, you know, people's dollars only go so far. Yeah. So yeah. Well, nice. I'm, I'm appreciative and I'll look forward to seeing what else you guys are adding. Um, okay. So let's talk, you and I spent a long time off air and we talk about this, I think every time, every time we chat, um, you know, what's new in precision hormone testing or how we want to test our hormones. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, there's some long time controversy in our field. Um, yeah. so why don't we, let's talk about new research. Let's talk about you know, let's touch on the controversy. Yeah. I mean, we might as well put, let's put it out there. Yeah. Well, and I think the, I mean, the biggest controversy in our industry is just where it's appropriate to use saliva, right? We have a saliva assay for cortisol. It's, as we talked about, it's fantastic. It's got unique information that's valuable. And so we put it out there. Uh, we also have salivary assays for testosterone and estradiol. Um, and as of now, um, we haven't seen um, that the value is there um, and that the quality can be at a level where it's good enough for baseline testing. There are two different issues. There's baseline testing, does it do an adequate job? And that depends on the hormone. And then there's the question of now, now that we're on therapy, now what? And that's the one um, that tends to be the most controversial. The one that gets ignored a lot, I think, is just the baseline testing. Um, there's actually a 2023 paper that came out, which was uh, it was a European group. Um, they looked at like 10,000 measurements. So this is a, mm -hmm. like a big study. 
well, it was a combination of like five studies. And, and they were looking at commercially available salivary estradiol assays. So that's like right up our alley, right? Like how well does this work um, for a baseline test to just ask the question, are you estrogen sufficient or deficient or do you have an excess? And so what they did is they took um, 10,000 measurements and they compared it to serum. And what they said is basically, hey, look, we got a thousand women collecting throughout their cycle through all these studies. So we also have their LH. So what you can do is if you just plot the cycle, it gets messy because some people are short, some people are long. But if you've got LH measurements, like those ovulation predictor kits, then they mm -hmm. can find ovulation. And if, yeah. if you take all of the data and you calibrate it around ovulation, then you know what biology is. A thousand women, sure, a handful of them are all messed up as far as they're not ovulating or whatever. But on the whole, it, you get the biology story, right? If you're doing this well, you get the story of female biology. And so what you get is a great big estradiol peak right on that LH peak. It's shifted by like a day or whatever, um, but it's a nice big peak. And then it comes back down and then it surges modestly in the luteal phase. So what they did in this study is they said, oh, we're going to take all this data and just see what it looks like. So they first took a set, a subset of serum data. And what they did is they said, this is the biological pattern we should see. This was actually just for your reference, Arslan, A-R-S-L-A-N. Um, okay, we'll, get, we'll pop it in the show notes, folks. To, to mm -hmm. give you a hint of where they ended up on it, the, the title is Not Within Spitting Distance. Salivary right, amino yeah, assays salivary. of estradiol have subpar validity for predicting cycle phases. And what they did is they said, we know what biology looks like. So let's take serum and compare actual serum measurements to the pattern we're supposed to see. And so what, you know, it's not perfect, right? And so what they found is for progesterone, the match was at like 80% in terms of theoretical versus actual. And the ester, now, now keep in mind, the progesterone pattern is big and like bold, right? So it's easier to match up. The, the match was like 70, 80%. And then for estradiol, it's a more subtle pattern. So you don't expect it to match perfectly. And the serum, which becomes your gold standard, was like 60% or something like that. Then they took all of the saliva data and they said, well, how well does that work? And what they found was really interesting with progesterone, you got this really nice analytical like lesson because when they took the data from the studies where they were using mass spec like research methods, then mm -hmm. it matched up at like, let's say two thirds, like it was close, like, hey, this works well enough. And then when you shift over one more, to not the research methods, but the commercially available methods. So these are like EIA. FDA, yes, they're FDA approved and they're the ones you can automate. That's why this is what pretty much everyone uses is you can automate it, you can do it more cost effectively. And the correlation to the real pattern there, instead of being modest as it was for the research methods was low. So it, when you look at the actual data, it's like, man, you can kind of see the pattern there, but it's lost a little bit because it's just not sensitive enough. Now you could spend some time. What is the, what is this FDA approved kit? It's EIA. Yeah. Well, they were multiples. Like they, they, they compared all of the research. They looked at all of the studies where they've looked okay. at hundreds and hundreds of women and their cycles and, and published the data. And yeah, okay. the EIA. So just the a Eliza, whole bunch of, yeah. Yeah. The, the ELISA testing, it was just okay. It wasn't yeah. as, it wasn't up to par really with what a serum assay would look like. And then, but the problem was when they shifted to estradiol, the saliva assay was just basically noise. Like the whole thing, when they plotted the all pattern. All kits, all methodologies. Yeah, they looked at the three most popular FDA approved kits. And in this data, there's no ovulatory peak. It's just kind of bleh. Complex problems need comprehensive solutions. The Dutch clinical team created the Mastering Functional Hormone Testing course to help you elevate your practice. Learn to decode and interpret Dutch test results with confidence, empowering you to effectively address your patient's complex hormone problems. Don't miss this opportunity to enhance your expertise and transform your patient care. Sign up now and unlock the secrets of functional hormone testing by visiting education.dutchtest.com. And so the, what the, the data actually said in, the, in the, the abstract, it basically said, if we know where you are in your cycle and we guess, that gave us better data than looking at this saliva data because it just doesn't have the sensitivity. I mean, keep in mind when we're doing a urine assay, 
and we're using mass spec, there's a thousand times more estrogen there than in those saliva samples. Like it's not, it's not the fault of oral fluid. It's the fact that the, the techniques that you use um, just aren't sensitive enough. And, and it gets so complicated because there's older data that actually look pretty decent, but those methods are like hmm. 20 times more sensitive. They're not automatable. That's the thing is oh, nobody, so wants not to sign, nobody wants to sign up to use those, but the yeah. data can be used to support it conceptually. So what was really cool about that study is when it got published, we had just finished like days before doing basically exactly that study with this Austrian group that's looking at BRCA patients. So they have a group of healthy controls a group of BRCA patients, they did enough testing in serum to kind of know what they're doing, but they wanted mass data. So they said, well, serum sucks for that. What should we do? So they used saliva. But when they did it, they contacted us and we said, listen, look at the data, but just while you're collecting, have them collect a dried urine sample every day and then we'll talk. And so they did all this saliva data and they found basically nothing. Like there was no pattern that matches biology. And so then they came back in behind that and they sent us, I don't know what it was. It was hundreds and hundreds of urine Specimen. samples from these women. And we did the same thing. We calibrated it to LH and there's this great big estrogen peak at, at there. And then, it, and then you're sort of mound in the luteal phase. And it was the same exact thing where the saliva progesterone data wasn't as good as ours because it's still kind of difficult, but you could see the biology there. You could see that, yeah. that peak, right? Mm -hmm. And then when they shifted to the estrogen, this just come on. Like they're just, they're, yeah, it's basically just noise. And on the same exact day, they have these dried urine samples. And the thing that was kind of fun about the study for us is ugh, getting researchers to like, listen is hard. They left the samples out at room temperature for two years. So these wow. samples were just <laughs> sitting in a box. Wow. We They sent them like, okay, so you froze them. They were like, wait, what? Froze what? Like, yeah, there's still a biological sample. You can't just leave them out for like two years. So they sat two years, they're totally compromised, but the data, like they're really stable when they're, they're dried and the data was beautiful. And then they were able to go in after that and find patterns for both progesterone and estrogen that were different in the BRCA patients. And so they're Good. teasing Yeah, that, that was out. my question. That was my right. question. What? Yeah. And so, so you, so you learned that your specimen are stable, at least for the sex hormone, at least for progesterone and estrogen for two years. I mean, is that what you learned? The, the, your yeah, collection I mean, method is pretty had, stable. <laughs> we've studied it out internally at 84 days, something like that. And at like 60 days, a few of the metabolites start to go. So we, we can't actually do that His, you you know, do a full regularly. Test. Yeah. Um, and whether some of those were compromised or not, we don't know. Uh, but the data still was beautiful. It correlated to serum. It correlated Good. to biology and they were yeah. able to find meaningful differences in cancer groups and non-cancer groups, um, which they're working on publishing. So I don't want to they're say too much on about publishing. that, but, um, but yeah, they've I'm been dying to out. know the difference though. I mean, you know, one of the things that a functioning BRCA gene does is kind of, you know, control aromatase activity. So I, 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 I'm curious, I mean, it's obviously, you know, tumor suppressor it does a lot yeah. of stuff but it's a it's a interesting I, yeah well and what's where in are they in the I'm writing still, it uh, it's submitted so, it's submitted yeah well it's submitted for progesterone which is not lower in the breast cancer group like it's a, it's an interesting um there's there yeah i'm still trying to piece together all of the significance of progesterone and breast cancer and all of that but then brock is a special subgroup right so it's sure. you know it's complicated so they're well, yeah, just that's thinking about review well, what it what it does and what the absence of it does but you know this is definitely off topic but it's my area of interest you can have a hypermethylated and inhibited BRCA gene but you you don't have the mutation so you could mm. have the effect of the mutation without the actual mutation so it would be interesting if they could st study that as well and kind of look at those with functioning BRCA genes you know functioning BRCA proteins yeah. And those with the actual mutations or hypermethylated, but that's that's yeah. a geeky aside. <laughs> I'll a look geeky for the aside paper, and you'll get nothing useful out of me out of it because you know me. Know. I'm, I'm, I'm an inch wide to mile deep. So just, I know, I know, I know, yeah. I know. It's like all right, Kara. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's um okay. So awesome. that's yeah. that's the um so we're, we're getting back to your actual yeah. question. So that publication 2023, like they really put to test the commercially available saliva panels that are, and this is not putting labs at the test. 
this is putting the technology to the test that I as a lab have available to me, right? So it's like, it's complicated in terms of what they're actually evaluating. So then as a lab, if I use those, even though they're FDA approved, like they're garbage. Now that doesn't mean you can't do some other method that's more sensitive. Um, the challenge that I put to people who are using saliva is if you ask the labs that are doing that, do they, do they have data for their method that correlates to serum? I don't think anyone does. So they have to, if they lean back on that data, it's not successful. The successful data that you have to lean back on are those non-automatable you what know, was it? How, what, the were the, what were those methods? RIA. Yeah, there's right. a long oh, okay. paper from 1990 where they get nice saliva data. It looks great. You know, it doesn't, it's not postmenopausal, it's just premenopausal, but it's a nice ovulatory peak, a nice luteal peak. There's serum correlation, but it's it's literally like using 50 times more sample than you put on an ELISA. So the fact that it works says that what's in saliva matters but you have to really prove that the way that you are doing it um, is actually correlating to something meaningful. And, you know, there, there isn't, I don't think there's any data out there that shows serum correlation for women in saliva for a commercially available test. Like that's something that the, the bar needs to be, I think, raised for. So that's, that's part of why we've stayed away from saliva for sex hormones is my baseline value isn't good. And the way you can see that practically, which we've talked about before, is you just look at the methods that are available and look at the reference ranges and the pre and post menopausal ranges tend to overlap, which tells you you're not separating out and showing me a real biology pattern because the real biology pattern tells me that a premenopausal woman makes 10 times more estrogen than a postmenopausal woman, if your ranges don't reflect that, there's not a gap between them, then you really, you're not going to characterize that woman well as to her need for estrogen. And then you get into the topic that we have gone over, you know, several times and it keeps evolving as well, which is um, when you're on therapy, now what is the best way to test? And of course, there's this yeah. weird dichotomy that when I talk about this in lectures, I usually start people with the data on testosterone injections, because it shows this ideal that we wish was true, is that if you give a, a man or a woman a testosterone injection and you plot urine, serum, and saliva, they all three go up in concert, down in concert. The magnitude of the increase is very similar. And so that would tell you conceptually, same story, use whichever one works well, whatever. But then when you move to creams and gels, you know, it's it's orders of magnitude difference. Either when you put a hormone on your skin, the saliva goes up, you know, orders of magnitude more than the serum or the saliva. And that's been known since like, what, early 2000s. And so our interpretation of that has changed over time as data has come out. And our industry has ended up split where some people say saliva is the way you should monitor hormone creams and gels. And some people, and I would definitely be in that camp, would say that that data is, it's not less valuable, it's completely clinically irrelevant and very misleading. Um, and so I've spent a lot of time, you know, as we've talked about, like really digging through the data of looking at every study that's been done on those to say, is there anything, anything that suggests that those inflated values in saliva are actually moving and correlating with clinical change, you know, the things that change with testosterone, the change, like with estrogen, it's hot flashes, it's vaginal atrophy, and it's bone, right? If those three things change with blood, change yeah. with urine, or change with saliva, we want to know which one. Um, and there aren't any studies that explore all of that. But if you, if you cobble all the studies together, you get a very consistent message. Serum and urine are consistently are, reliable. Are consist well, so there's a, a paper that I think that's really underappreciated. Um, it's not that new, 2012 Archer paper. So what mm -hmm. he did is he put women on different doses of estrogel. So it's 0 0.27, 0 0.375, 0 0.75, 1.5. So you've got this span of, of results. And yeah. then he looked at serum and serum went from five to 12 to 21 to like 35 and then 50 something something like that so it scaled up mm -hmm. according and then to dosage put, yeah yeah and if you put women on that and you look at their urine results which we published this last year it's a pretty similar pattern in that at one and a half or two milligrams you'll be up in the luteal range and at a low dose like 0 0.25 0 0.27 it'll increase but not very much 
And then you say, can you pause and say, okay, so I've got change over time, change with the dosing. What happens with those same products with saliva? And the data there is not, there's not a lot of published data, but if you, again, cobble together what's been put out there as just observational data, what you find is that even at 0.25, you're above the luteal range. And, the, and, and that's at 24 hours. That's like when you're ready for your next dose. So you spend your entire day for the average woman outside the luteal range. And then as you, as you give more and more hormone, of course, those numbers go up. You say, okay, that's a very different message. So which one correlates with clinical outcome? And maybe the best way to, to ask that is to stop and predict it. If your estrogen exposure is higher than a luteal amount of estrogen, on that low dose that Archer studied, which he studied clinical outcomes, that's why it's an interesting study, um, you would expect massive clinical response at 0.27 and then even more at higher doses. And when you, yeah. get, to, when you get to doses like 0.75, your conclusion would be like, this is crazy, stop giving these women so much estrogen. Mm -hmm. If on the other hand, serum and urine are telling the right story, you should get some clinical failure at those lower doses because it's changing, yes, but not that much. And right. what Archer showed is that that 0.27 dose where the, the, the serum and the urine have gone up just a little bit, it failed for vaginal atrophy. And for hot flashes, it failed until you used it for 12 weeks, which is a really good indication that yes, there's estrogen in there, but it's not very much, right? right? And if you look at the saliva data, obviously it tells a very different story. Um, if you go back to the bone mineral density study, which is a different group, they mm -hmm. found that at 0.75, yes, it helped bones, but it, it didn't work as well as like a low dose patch. Like it was very, very clearly a modest dose of estrogen. So you've got all three hot flashes, vaginal atrophy, and bone mineral density to tell this story that in that 0.25 to 0.75 range of an estrogen gel, it's like it works, but it's not hefty. And then you, yeah. and then that's what urine and serum say. That's what the clinical picture says. And then at those same doses, the saliva data is just really, really high. The thing that has always clouded that is the most typical outcome for taking estrogens clinically would be what? What would be the top thing you're monitoring in your patient when you're giving them um, estrogen therapy? Well, I mean, most commonly, obviously, is hot flashes. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And when you look at the studies, Guess what happened? Guess what explains 50% of the benefit of hot flashes? Placebo. Like right. when you look at the placebo arm, it works really well. You give someone a cream and say, hey, there's estrogen in this. And mm -hmm. a lot of women feel a lot better. But mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, you can't fool with placebo. And that's someone's bones. So when right. you go, so you've got people, what they've done historically is used micro doses of estrogen. The saliva goes up and they go, oh, we're good. Not, not only are we, are we good, the numbers like, healthy. You do not want to use more. That's the message yeah. that they get. And the patient comes back and says, well, I feel better. And, and, and the thing too, is these are typically brilliant doctors. So they're dealing with the gut. They're dealing with lifestyle. They're dealing with their stress. They're dealing with their cortisol. The patient doesn't feel better. They feel a lot better. And then they mm -hmm. have a placebo effect from the estrogen. And then seven years later, it's like, crap, they have osteoporosis. Like what happened? You know, it's like, well, mm -hmm. you, you were treating with what you thought was a modest to aggressive dose of estrogen. And in fact, you were almost you're using, giving, you're right. almost giving nothing. Right. Um, and so that's, that's the, the issue where people have really gotten caught up here and where people have learned lessons the hard way of having patients with bone loss and having to go back to the drawing board. And if you follow the data, um, the answers are there. They're just, they're just complicated. That's really interesting. Okay. So I think, Okay. So most consistently reliable are uh, for baseline and uh, follow-up after th initiating therapy or, you know, according to your, you know, really careful read on the literature for what's available, including methodology is urine and serum. Well, so for serum, you want to use LCMS because the serum mm -hmm. ELISAs will fall yes. apart in the postmenopausal yes. range. And then the caveat to that, which is very significant, is that if it's a cream or a gel, the serum really moves too fast. If you look at the pharmacokinetics that are published, uh, there's, there's one paper that looks at estrogen gels. It was bias. They use 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and it goes up and down in a couple hours. So if you go out here and you test in serum, 
and you get a low number, what people say a lot is they're like, well, it's not there. Like there's some magical way it avoids, but it gets everywhere in your body, but it avoids the serum. And then they go test in saliva and they go, oh, it's over here. We found it, right? Because mm-hmm. you get these really big numbers and that's driven a lot of people, rightfully so, to say, well, I guess this works better. But what, what's happening there is the response isn't as extreme as you think. The target isn't as high as you think, right? In serum, you only have to get north of like 20 picograms per milliliter to get significant impact. And into like the mid thirties, you're getting decent bone impact. You don't need to be up at a hundred where a premenopausal woman once lived. Like you don't, you just don't need that much estrogen, but then you've got this pharmacokinetic challenge. So with a patch, it's pretty stable and the serum works well. But for pharmacokinetics, this is where I think urine is a fantastic choice and why it just levels it out. Yeah, yeah because if you average it over time. There's a mm-hmm. uh, Jarvin and published a paper where they looked at Divi gel and they tested the women over over time. And it, the first collect the first part where they tested, the results were a little higher than you want. And then in the middle of the day, they were lower than you want. And then later in the day, they said they weren't using it twice a day. The data is weird. But the, in the later in the day, the result was really high. So you're high, normal, low high. It's like, well, what, which one of those numbers do you want? Well, I don't want any of them unless you're going to give me all of them and then integrate them or whatever. And if you do that, the data works really well, but of course nobody does that. And that's like the magic of urine is it collects over time, right? Our our four collections represent 14 hours of your day. So you take those highs and lows, you average them out. And then that data, it seems to correlate well with like an integrated serum. And it, it overlays nicely with the clinical picture that says, when I push out of the postmenopausal range with those doses, there's minimal clinical efficacy. And then as I push close to the luteal range, you don't need to be in the luteal range necessarily, but as you get close, that's where you see the type of effect that doctors typically want, right? Which is robust increase in bone mineral density and then pretty solid vaginal atrophy and hot flash improvement, but you haven't been super aggressive. And that's kind of where we, we have people you know, shoot for um, but admittedly, you have to piece together the data that's available to make that case because nobody is doing outcome studies with comprehensive testing. And that's something that I'm trying to push for, um, which, you know, we just have one piece of that puzzle. So we need, you know, help essentially in terms of um, collaborating with people um, on maybe the pharmacy. Are side there data banks? Whatever. I mean, are there, are there, can you access like NHANES data, like NIH data or something? Um, well, it, none of it includes urine because nobody right, well, know, traditionally is measuring hormones yeah. in urine. But for the serum, you can piece I it together. If they bank it. With the serum. Oh. Yeah, but you, but not. the literature, like Archer's study, lays it out nicely. The problem is that serum number that he reports, it's doing this, and you're trying, right. you're shooting right, right. at a moving target. You know, it's moving up and right. down, um, and so that's where the, the. I mean, the case for urine has really only been made the last two years. I mean, we published our first. HRT paper in 22, and then another one in 23, and another one in 23, and then we've got um, our latest one, which is creams, gels, and patches in a a comparison, um, is out for review with menopause right now, and so I'm really excited to get that into print, because people in our industry say all the time, you cannot monitor estrogen creams with urine testing, and the, the data is there. Again, it overlays nicely with um, the outcome data in gels. That's but that's part of my sort of gripe with ourselves as an industry is we need to put more into research because when you get to the creams, yeah. there, there literally are zero outcome studies for compounded estrogen creams, not a huh. single one. And that, that I think is wow. something we need to remedy. You know, is yeah. what, what dose actually increases your bone mineral density? Everyone is guessing. Everyone yeah. is guessing because right. nobody's ever proven it. Wow, that's so fascinating. God, I mean, somebody could probably do, you know, enlarge some of these larger clinics doing um, bioidentical compounded HRT, you know, just go in and do a retrospective chart analysis, you know. And yeah, well, and anyone and, who's doing DEXA or whatever for yeah. bone, like they've done it anecdotally. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. There's, you could probably there's pull... not a thing in print, which yeah. you know, would be a service to our industry, um, you know, to, to get that better established, so. Yeah, I can hear your story has evolved over the years, you know. I mean, you used to be you know, using serum more often than not. Now you're really coming out on, you know, the validity in urine, just speaking well, to your recent research and your, you know, the well, paper I started that in got. saliva. 
I mean, I, I, uh, you know, not to be like insulting about it, but I drank the Kool-Aid. I mean, I was taught that those high numbers in saliva are meaningful and you should shoot for them. And I, and, and, and I, I lectured on it. Like I cobbled together this story of misappropriated research and then data that kind of made sense if you didn't ask enough critical questions. And it was actually, you know, Dr. George Gilson, who owned a saliva lab at the time in Canada and said, you are wrong, keep digging. Um, and, you know, and he would send me data and eventually- He owned a saliva lab? Yeah. And he was the, he's the only saliva like person I've ever heard from that has said saliva testing works for this. It does not work for this. The data doesn't actually support it. Um, and the two of us have collaborated on that topic for a decade now. Um, and for me, the, the, the statement that makes the most sense is that saliva has special access to fat stored hormones when you apply it transdermally. If you, if you filter all of the data through that, to me, all of it makes sense. Um, you know, it's, it's a complicated picture, um, but when you put fat stored hormones on, for some reason you get gobs of it you in saliva. An accumulation and, there. Yeah. The question yeah. is why, like, what's the mechanism there, you know? Yeah. I mean, people have theorized lymphatic transport and that sort of thing, but, but when you go in why? and say, does that number for testosterone correlate with bone? muscle, yeah. sexual function, LH suppression, Doesn't. DHT production, estrogen production. That's all in the literature. You can look at all of those things and realize, oh, it doesn't correlate at all to those really high values. Time to go in a different direction. And with estrogen, you know, we just talked about it. it's the same thing. It doesn't correlate with the clinical outcomes. Um, and it, you know, our industry has got to move beyond that, but we we've struggled, or at least a fraction of the market has really struggled, I think, to, um, all right. keep asking critical Listen. questions and yeah so let me just i'm gonna just I, first of all we need the we need the little take-home cheat sheet from your marketing team that summarizes what you've just said but i'm gonna just say to you i'm, uh, I'm gonna name a hormone and you're gonna tell me in you get three words what <laughs> what 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 uh specimen and maybe if you need to method i'll give you specimen and method okay and we're uh, we're with or without hormones in this game We'll do baseline and we'll do okay. post. We'll do ther with therapy. Okay. So let's <laughs> do right. let's start with baseline. You get three, you get three words. Method and specimen. Um, baseline, testosterone. Serum, LCMS, especially for women. Meaning the LCMS is especially for women. Yeah. Right. Got it. Yeah. And you That's can find and folks. Feature. You can find LCMS if you're going to your standard reference lab quest and so lab course. I think they call them. Say it again. You just got to pay a little more. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I think they're, you know, you can look at the methodology or I think they're called ultra sensitive or high, or, or the high sensitivity. Yeah, that's complicated because there's, yeah. there's an old school ultra sensitive for estradiol. That's an RIA. It works fine. Um, it's just, but you, today, okay. it's just oh. easier to say, give me LCMS for testosterone. Okay. So you could just write it on your, on your rack LCMS or something and get it. Okay. That's fine. I don't know. I don't do um, what go to your lab. All right. We have to keep going because we're in the middle of the game, but just remember LCMS folks, testosterone. Yeah. Serum. Um, estrogen. Dutch. Hey, one word. That's good. Um, if serum LCMS. Okay. But we, but you've just said, and I will say these words, you, the caveat is that it can be depending on the time of day that you're testing, it can be all over the, all over the map. So it's that 24 hour we're talking specimen. About baseline. You uh, said we're talking about baseline. Oh, that's right. We're in baseline. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Dutch, Dutch. And if you're yeah, serum, and the serum would be serum would be second and if serum LCMS and it works fine. Okay. Okay. So that's testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. Yeah. And then, and the reason I'm leaning into Dutch more for estradiol is because I, I think the value is really solid, but then you get all the metabolites as well. Um, yeah. That's the thing to me that, that pushes it over, um, over, serum if we're just talking about baseline yes and the metabolites are hugely hugely useful for anybody not familiar with them and we haven't touched on them today but we yeah. have in previous conversations yeah. um okay progesterone baseline progesterone um serum, no, sorry. Serum's, easy. serum's easy you just have time uh, <laughs> I, serum's not, easy. No. Um, I, I think the urine is proven to be equ equivalent and saliva is really method dependent um 
So, but ser serum works fine. Uh, there's one paper that shows that during the day it can bounce more than you would. I can't believe it's as much as that paper shows, but like that the woman bounces from like five to 35 throughout the day. So there's a big advantage for urine. So I like urine for progesterone. I like serum for progesterone. Saliva is just okay for me. Okay. It depends on the method. And I think that by and large, the methods being used today aren't great. The FDA approved methods stink. For saliva, yeah. For, for saliva. For, for serum, the levels are so high in serum that the methodology is not that important for progesterone. So, and keep in mind, I'm okay. answering this for Dutch. I mean, the main advantage that Dutch always has is, is the comprehensiveness, right? It's good for progesterone, yes. it's good for estrogen. I mean, the main thing that we have to offer is, and then you get the cortisol picture and then, and, yep. and, and it's the, and yep. that makes us, I think, so valuable, um, you know, for isolated testing serums, usually going to be cheaper because it's, you know, 80 bucks or whatever. Right. You're but you're going to get, hormone. You're going to get all those fabulous metabolites. You're going right. to get the cortisol awakening response because just get the Dutch plus. You might as well. I mean, I only use the Dutch plus these days and, yeah. you know, get it. I, I test mine, but I guess, I suppose if you're using a follow-up because you're evaluating therapy, you may not need the car if the car was fine, but anyway, yeah. you don't need to go down that rabbit hole. Okay. So let's get back to um, follow-up testing. You've initiated therapy. So follow-up testing, testosterone, best specimen. Testosterone is nice that it's simple. Uh, serum. Serum. Serum as a primary. Dutch is a nice complementary product, right? Because it, it'll show you how much estrogen am I making? How am I yep. breaking that down? How am I yep. breaking down my testosterone? If my yep. man has low testosterone and symptoms to go along with that, you want to keep his cortisol managed also. Because if you're stressed out of your mind, your low T symptoms are going to get worse. So yes. Dutch is complementary. Serum is primary. Awesome. Okay. T that's testosterone. Estrogen. Follow-up testing. So you're on th hormone therapy specimen. So if it's, oh, I don't recommend oral, but if it's oral, it's got to be serum. If it's transdermal, vaginal, I think Dutch is awesome. We've published data for all of those patches, gels, creams, vaginal. Um, you get the metabolites. I think that's the best. I think that's the best way to go. Serum works if you're on patches. Otherwise the up and down pattern is just, I don't like it. Okay. Bad. Okay. So and the easiest unknown. is is Dutch progesterone specimen. There is not a lab test that will tell you what's going on in the endometrium or any way that people take progesterone. That's an important thing for people to know. Is there feedback from labs that can be useful? Yes. Um, but none of it speaks for the endometrium. You know, you, I mean, we could talk about that if we wanted to, but there, there are different reasons for vaginal, different reasons for oral, different reasons for serum and urine as to why it doesn't speak well for it. But if you're using vaginal progesterone, I don't think there's really a lot of useful feedback from labs. We know what doses work, we use it, it works. Uh, with oral, the serum and, serum and saliva should be avoided, I think, because you can misdose someone because um, it goes up and down so fast, right? If you, if you study the behavior of bats and you only study them during the day, you never learn the critical information because the critical information happens while you're sleeping, right? Same thing with oral progesterone. You take it at bedtime, it goes up and down really fast, and then you test in the morning. That's a really bad idea. Uh, with urine, with progesterone, um, the urine tells you about the GABA impacting metabolites like allopregnanolone. How much do you make of that? That can be interesting, but that doesn't mm -hmm. tell you about the endometrium. So there's limited value in labs for monitoring for progesterone. progesterone therapy. That's the main lesson and don't use transdermal, right. not for, not for balancing estrogen. It is not proven to work. Okay. 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 So we just obviously need to pay attention to clinical and, and, you know, do, do imaging and the studies, right? We know that hundred and 200 of oral works. We know mm -hmm. that what is it? 45 and 90 or whatever works for vaginal. We know that works. Yeah. Um, and other than that, there's no like lab magic number that if you hit it, it works. Like when you're not on therapy, we know what number means you're ovulating, it's enough, whatever, but it just doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't stack up if you're on therapy. It's just, yeah, it doesn't, it just doesn't work that way. Well, listen, this was a really fun conversation, Mark. I know I'm going to just, you know, we're going to play like three second answers. <laughs> People yeah, are going to yeah. find, we're going to, they're going to find this valuable. And maybe my team can kind of collate a little bit of a table, a take-home table. It's super, super useful information. I just love talking to you. I love geeking out with you. And I know we'll get to hang out at a conference. I'll see you certainly in December, but that's, a, that's a ways off in Vegas for April. Yes. But... yes. Well, geeking <laughs> out will continue. Yeah. 
All right. Anything, anything else, anything that, that I missed or did, I think we covered, we, we covered a lot of material. Um, yeah, no, I think, uh, I think that was, that's a good conversation. So, uh, there, there's too much more to, uh, to, <laughs> to go into anything else. So, but I think, yeah, no, I appreciate the conversation and, uh, it's been fun. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining me.